Sunday, the 15th of February, 1637, saw the beginning of a week of festivities in the newly constructed pleasure palace of the Buen Retiro on the eastern outskirts of Madrid, which you see here in a painting probably by Giuseppe Leonardo, painted just about the same moment. And uh, there are two great courts there, the Plaza Principal, and to the left, the Plaza Grande, just finished, where uh, the festivities would be held. And dividing them is the Hall of Realms, the great central hall, which I'll mention later. Now, this was the carnival season, 1637, which was traditionally celebrated with equestrian games, comedias, poetic contests, and dramatic spectacles. But this year's celebrations were more than usually lavish and spectacular because there was so much to celebrate. News had arrived from Vienna that Philip IV's brother-in-law, the King of Hungary, had secured election as King of the Romans thus ensuring that the imperial title would remain with the Austrian Habsburgs. In addition, Spanish forces had been winning victories in Italy, while the army of Flanders, under the command of the king's brother, the Cardinal Infante, had secured, scored important successes against the French and the Dutch in 1636. And not surprisingly, no effort was spared to make the most of these triumphs. The Count Duke of Olivares, the controlling hand in palace festivities, as in everything else, wrote to the Cardinal Infante, with the election of the King of the Romans, your Royal Highness cannot imagine how mad life has been with so many fiestas. The masquerade was a right royal fiesta, and in my view, there's never been another in Spain to equal it. Well, in this masquerade, Following behind the teams of splendidly attired horsemen who were to compete in the equestrian games were two enormous triumphal cars pulled by 48 oxen disguised as rhinoceroses. The cars, some 13 meters high, nine meters long, seven meters wide, were profusely decorated with pyramids, balustrades, garlands, crowns, busts of heroes and images of emperors. And as night fell, each car was illuminated by more than a hundred torches. The two cars, designed by Cosimo Lotti, the Florentine expert in stage productions and theatrical machinery, who walked in front of his creation, represented respectively the triumphs of war and peace. The car of peace, led by Jupiter, bearing olive branches and flowers, was crowned by an allegorical figure of religion, while the car of war was led by Saturn, bearing laurels and branches of palms, and was topped by a figure representing justice. As the procession entered the arena, the two cars halted, one on either side of the balcony where the queen was seated. The tournament and equestrian exercises then began with both the king and the Count Duke taking part. And once the sports were over, Comediantes staged a dialogue between war and peace in front of the queen. The author of the dialogue, which explained to the assembled company the meaning of the allegorical representations on the cars, was the greatest of Spain's living playwrights, Pedro Calderón de la Barca. Unfortunately, the text of Calderón's dialogue does not survive, but contemporary discussions of matters of war and peace can allow us to make a plausible guess as to its general drift. As a starting point, we might take Exhortation 30 of the Exhortaciones Varias Doctrinales, published in 1641 by the Count Duke's Jesuit confessor, Padre Francisco Aguado, which contains what might be called a theology of war. Aguado begins his exhortation by asking, why so much noise of war, such accumulation of arms and gathering of munitions? What does God our Lord intend for so Catholic a kingdom as this, where his name is so esteemed, where his religion is so favored, and where faith 
holds such sway when it is everywhere engulfed by wars and harried by enemies. Sacred scripture, Aguado suggested, provided three reasons why a people chosen by God should be so afflicted. One was to test how far they would remain faithful to his law as he tested the Israelites in their struggles with the Canaanites. The second was to teach them, even in times of peace, always to be on their guard with sword in hand. The third was to serve as a reminder that there were afflictions even worse than war, famine and plague, for example. Perhaps, he suggested, Spain, in fighting its wars, would escape still greater evils, and the French are better enemies to have than the terrible capital vices. If Aguado's words provide a general context for Spanish thinking about war as both inevitable and necessary for a nation chosen by the Lord, the manifestos and pamphlets commissioned by the Olivares regime on the outbreak of war with France in 1635 to persuade public opinion of the justice of Spain's struggle offer a more specific context forgetting at the contents of this 1637 dialogue between war and peace. If we take, for example, the arguments of Alonso Guillén de la Carrera, one of the most cogent of Olivares' team of polemicists, we find him firmly asserting that Spain's war was defensive, holy, and religious. For Guillén, as for his colleagues, the ideal was concord among Christian princes, but they saw concord as resulting from the imposition of a Pax Austriaca, under which the House of Austria, as the champion of the faith, held the forces of heresy at bay and maintained order and stability through Christendom. In this reading of the international system, Spain was never the aggressor, but constantly found itself engaged in just and defensive wars to protect the church and the faith and preserve the dynastic and territorial interests of the Habsburgs, always under attack from one or other of their enemies. The presence of the figure of a religion crowning the car of peace in the 1637 masquerade was therefore evidence that only God could confer on Christendom the peace for which it yearned, and by extension that this peace would only come if Spain remained faithful to God's wishes and obedient to his laws. Those wishes, as Father Aguado maintained, meant that God's chosen people should be ever vigilant in the defense of his cause. Under attack, they must resist. It was therefore natural that the figure of justice should preside over the car of war, for Spain's wars were just wars as defined by the theologians and canon lawyers. The two triumphal cars in the parade were in effect representations in allegorical form of the arguments that had been deployed by Olivares' propaganda machine two years earlier. Peace was ide the ideal, but peace, lasting peace, could only be secured by fighting wars that were both necessary and just. Heavy sacrifices were called for, but the laurels of victory had first to be won before it became possible to spread the olive branches of peace along the way. For Spain, as for the rest of early modern Europe, the car of war and the car of peace moved permanently in tandem. War was the natural condition of a human race conceived and born in sin. Peace was a divine blessing bestowed by God when in his mercy he was touched by the sufferings of his peoples and satisfied with their efforts to meet their obligations towards him. But there were lessons to be learnt before the blessings of peace could be reaped. What God especially wants of us, wrote Father Aguado, is that we should take courage and trust in him and be certain that the more numerous the wars that afflict Spain, the more these will serve to give it stability and firmness. In other words, war was a necessary trial which taught the people constancy in the face of adversity and trust in their creator. By refining and elevating them, it prepared them to enjoy all the better the fruits of the peace that would one day come. And yet it was generally recognized that if war was both necessary and inevitable 
This should never deter monarchs and statesmen from striving incessantly for peace, the greatest of all blessings. So it's not surprising to find in 17th century Europe that negotiations for peace tended to begin almost before the first shots were fired and would continue to be pursued amidst the noise of battle. If war was a necessary prelude to peace, peace was seen as always traveling in the company of war, as in the festivities at the Buen Retiro. And yet, if questions of war and peace were seen and debated within a Christian framework, they, are, they were also heavily colored by the secular characteristics of early modern societies. These, as we all know, were societies characterized and conditioned by a culture of war. War was taken for granted as a permanent fact of life and was institutionalized within the European state system. And the outlook of Europe's elites, as we heard yesterday, was permeated by an aristocratic ethos that drew its inspiration from codes of chivalry and its strength from notions of honor, revenge, and glory deeply instilled in the ruling class. Nowhere in 17th century Europe was this ethos more powerfully present than in the Spain of Don Quixote. Here, after all, was a society forged in the heat of a centuries-long struggle against Islam, a struggle renewed in the 16th century as the Spain of Charles V and Philip II confronted the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean and on the coasts of North Africa. And well after the struggle had ended in stalemate, the Turks indeed remained a touchstone when Spain faced other enemies. In 1630, in his frustration at the behavior of the French in the conflict over the Mantuan succession, Olivares observed in the Council of State that truly the Turks in times of open war are less pernicious enemies of your majesty than the French when peace has been agreed. War with Islam, and then with the heretics of Northern Europe, reinforced the traditional values of a warrior society. In Golden Age Spain, letters might have become the companion of arms, but arms and the cult of arms remained deeply embedded in the mentality and to a lesser extent in the practice of Spain's elite. The jousts and tournaments in the 1637 festivities in the Buen Retiro testify to the persistence of a tradition which the king and his first minister were determined to maintain and promote. In September 1632, for instance, Philip IV wrote to the president of the Council of Castile expressing his concern that the Castilian nobility was no longer capable of fulfilling its obligations because of the inadequate upbringing of its youth. Horseback riding and all the other military and activities and, ac and exercises, he wrote, have been forgotten. A major failing whose consequences are all too apparent in my armies and fleets to the detriment of the nation. And he accompanied his letter with a paper written by the Count Duke urging the creation of academies for the training of the sons of the elite, a proposal which in the end came to nothing and like so much else was sacrificed uh, ironically in this case, to the demands of war. While court festivities did at least something to keep the old chivalric and military traditions alive, the ideals that those traditions had fostered in the Castilian elite and more widely in Castilian society at large remained vigorous and strong. And we can catch, catch glimpses of them in the remarks made by the Count of Benavente in a session of the Council of State in July of 1621, when the resumption of active war against the Dutch was being discussed following the expiration of the 12 years truce. Benevente was opposed to renewing the truce, one of his arguments being that war would prevent a people as brave as the Spanish from becoming effeminate, as happens when they are left in idleness. It was war, in other words, that kept Spain virile, and exactly the same point would later be made by Padre Aguado when, his, in his exhortation in defense of war, he wrote that our Lord wishes Spaniards to know what fighting is and that they should exercise arms and not become effeminate and soft and more prone to vice as a consequence of peace. In view of this attitude, the violent controversy that erupted in the late 1620s 
over the proposal that St. Teresa should become co-patron of Spain with St. James of Compostela, with Santiago, becomes fully comprehensible. It was Santiago who'd led Spain to victory in its many wars. And for Francisco de Quevedo and many others, the idea that a woman should join him as a patron of warrior society was unthinkable. As Juan de Robles wrote, in good reason and philosophy, can there be anything more ridiculous than to offer the image and name of a woman to the eyes and ears of men, either to terrify them or to incite them to military ardor and infuse them with courage and daring? But perhaps it's worth noting that the Virgin Mary does not seem to have been included in this anti-feminist rhetoric. <laughs> it's clear, wrote Padre Aguado, that she is the beautiful moon of our church and the captain of its armies. And always, if we make use of her favor and honor her with the bread of heaven, we shall find her ready to give us splendid victories and glittering triumphs. As early as 1609, in his España Defendida, Quevedo had denounced the effeminacy of the current generation of Spanish men, which was now such as to make their sex itself doubtful. Hace dudoso el sexo, he writes. In doing so, he recalled the Castile of four or five hundred years earlier, when men were men, living simple virtuous lives, fighting for their patria and religion under the protection of their patron Santiago. This nostalgic vision of a Castile that never was remained lodged in the minds of those who made decisions about war and peace in the Spain of Philip II's successors, and it drew additional nourishment from contemporary comparisons between the Monarchia Española and its predecessor, the Roman Empire, whose greatness it had eclipsed. Salus and Seneca had shown what happened to empires when their men became soft, and Spain showed every sign of moving on the downward path previously trodden by imperial Rome. What was needed to halt the process of decline was a return to the old values that had made Castile and Spain great, its martial spirit, frugality, discipline, and order. These were the, virtue, the values promoted and proclaimed in the Christian neo-Stoic philosophy of Justus Lipsius, whose works had such an impact on the generation that came to power in 1621, the generation of Olivares. It would be in their spirit that Olivares would propose in 1625 the revival of the chivalric order founded by Alfonso XI in 1330, the Orden de la Banda, as a means of honoring and rewarding those who served the king in his armies and his fleets. In the eyes of those who took over the government of Spain on the accession of Philip IV in 1621, the country's rulers during the reign of his father, uh, and notably Philip III's favorite and principal minister, the Duke of Lerma, had set the monarchia on the road to disaster. At home, they'd failed to introduce reforms, had plunged Spain into deep corruption. Abroad, they'd signed a humiliating 12 years truce with the Dutch rebels in 1609. Everywhere, their perceived weakness had given encouragement to Spain's enemies and diminished the reputation of his king, of its king. Reputation, reputacion, had long been an important word in the vocabulary of Spanish councillors of state. In honor-based societies, the concept of reputation, how others saw oneself, was of critical importance for the maintenance of dignity and status. When applied to affairs of state and relations between one state and another, it signaled the grave dangers likely to be incurred if a monarch lost face. Olivares and his colleagues were very conscious of this. They knew that Giovanni Botero, whose Ragion di Stato was an essential handbook for 17th century statesmen. In it, Botero had written, the knowledge of how to disguise one's own weakness is important. Many weak rulers succeeded in maintaining a reputation for strength, not by making themselves stronger, but simply by hiding their weaknesses. Dissimulation would be an essential weapon in the armor of the Olivares regime as it faced a hostile world. In the discussions of the Council of State about a possible renewal of the truce with the Dutch, the Count of Benevente, 
who was so concerned about the growing danger of effeminacy in the new generation, argued that for the conservation of the monarchia, four principal things are required. Good governance of the finances and the fleets, peace in Italy, and war in Flanders. The conclusion, in the light of all this, all that's been said, is that it's necessary to have a good war, una buena guerra, or everything will be lost. In practice, the new regime, by virtue of the fact that it was determined to draw a sharp distinction between itself and its predecessor, committed itself from its very first days to a good war, una buena guerra, to militant policies that would mark its rejection of the pacifist policies of the Lerma regime. And a good war meant, in the first instance, a return to active warfare against the Dutch Republic, forcing the leaders of the Republic to agree to peace terms less humiliating than those agreed in the Truce of 1609. And alongside the resumption of the war in the Netherlands, Spain's new rulers found themselves being dragged against their wishes into the escalating conflict in Central Europe in support of the Vienna branch of the House of Austria and the Imperial Authority. And they'd also find themselves engaged in 1625 in war with England following the breakdown of the negotiations for an Anglo-Spanish marriage. Wars, it soon transpired, were more easily begun than ended. And yet those first years of the reign of Philip IV were years of major victories, culminating in Spain's Annus Mirabilis of 1625. After a long siege, the Dutch surrendered Breda to the army of Flanders under the command of Ambrosio Spinola in July of that year. A joint Castilian-Portuguese expeditionary force drove the Dutch out of Brazil. The fleet commanded by the Marquis of Santa Cruz relieved the city of Genoa, Spain's ally, which was under siege from the Savoyard and the French, and an invading English force was ignominiously routed at Cadiz. No wonder that an excited Olivares could write in a letter to the Count of Gondomar, courage, senor mio, God is Spanish and fights for our nation these days. And the euphoria created by the victories of the early 1620s would find expression in the court theater of these years notably in Lope de Vega's El Brasil Restituido and Calderón's El Sitio de Breda. And these same victories would later be visually depicted in the series of battle paintings commissioned in 1634-5 for the Hall of Realms, the central hall of the Palace of the Buen Retiro. And this is a virtual reconstruction uh, of the Hall of Realms with, at the end, the portraits by Velázquez of Philip IV and his queen and Balthazar Carlos, the three equestrian portraits of the royal family. And round the walls, uh, starting on the left here, you just see the corner of the Surrender of Breda by Velázquez, a series of 12 battle paintings and interspersed with images by Thorberan of the life and struggles of Hercules, the founding father of the Spanish dynasty. And yet, if the drums were beating in the Spain of the mid-1620s, Olivares was well aware that it would not, could not afford to remain permanently at war. Its major policy, in a major policy paper, which he produced at the end of 1626, he wrote, I regard it as certain that the coming year of 1627 will mark the critical moment for the well-being or ill-being of this monarchy in which we either achieve a universal peace of the highest reputation, or alternatively, we lose this hope completely or in large measure. And the question before the Council of State, he went on, was whether to make peace proposals to both the Dutch and the English, or to one or the other. I presume, he said, that peace is more useful, expedient, and necessary for your majesty than for any other prince in the world, because as you are the greatest prince of the world, you will derive more benefit from rest and peace than all the others. And there was no doubt then about the importance of peace to Spain, but the Count Duke went on to compare its position to that of the lion in the jungle. No animal, he said, is a friend of the lion, but not all fight with it, and this is not out of love, but out of respect and fear. And the conclusion he drew from this analogy was that it was for this crown to embrace peace and say that it wants it but in no way to propose it. In other words, for the King of Spain, as the greatest monarch in the world, 
Peace with honor was the only respectable option, and honor precluded making the first moves for peace. And over and over again, in his negotiations with the Dutch and later with the French, this approach to international relations would limit the Count Duke's room for maneuver, and the universal peace to which he looked forward in 1626 would continue to escape him. He always wanted that further concession, that one bit extra, to ensure that his monarch did not lose face. But this all or nothing approach, which suggests a degree of recklessness in the Count Duke as a statesman, was offset by the realism appropriate to a man well acquainted with the maxims of Botero and Lipsius on the need for prudentia. Prudence involved a willingness to tack with the winds and a recognition of the importance of Botero's observation observations on the close relationship between military power and a flourishing economy. When war was resumed with the United Provinces in 1621, it involved economic warfare, as well as the more conventional warfare of skirmishes and sieges, with Madrid mounting a systematic campaign to strangle Dutch trade. And it was symbolic of this new approach to war that the Count Duke, in proposing the revival of the military order of La Banda, wanted it to include honors for merchants as well as for soldiers and sailors. Olivares had grasped that in the new world of the 17th century, the old chivalric ideals were no longer sufficient. Those ideals, however, still survived amidst the horrors of modern warfare and were famously displayed in Velázquez's depiction of the surrender of Breda, on which uh, Marc Fumaroli has written so eloquently uh, in a lecture uh, and given a lecture in the, to the Friends of the Prado, and also in Maino's companion piece in the Hall of Realms on the recapture of Bahia in Brazil, Juan Bautista Maino, that the themes of magnanimity, clemency, and compassion were more than simply the consequence of artistic imagination is shown by the reaction of Olivares when news arrived of the victories in the Netherlands of Brazil. The victory in Brazil, he wrote, is no less good than that of Breda. The enemy finally yielded to the clemency of the general and so saved their lives and embraced and enhanced our reputation. For to pardon those who surrender confers glory on his majesty's arms and God willing, clemency will work more to our advantage than the sword. And there you see the Dutch soldiers kneeling before a portrait uh, of Philip IV uh, with Olivares crowning him with laurels behind and Minerva. And Olivares' comment on clemency suggests that magnanimity and victory was not only an ideal noble in itself, but also that it responded to the requirements of prudentia, as suggested by Justus Lipsius in his discussion of war and peace in his six books of politics. It was important, Lipsius argued, not to drive the enemy to desperation. After instilling fear in them, it is expedient by pardoning them to indicate a desire for peace. And equally, it was prudentia, an accommodation to the realities of the world as it was, that persuaded Olivares of the need to give Spanish support to Huguenot rebels in France, having first cleared that policy with a junta of theologians in Madrid. For him, as for Richelieu, alliance with heretics could be justified in the name of the greater good. Prudentia involved a willingness to seize opportunities, which is what Olivares tried to do when a dispute arose over the Manchuk succession at the end of 1627. But in deciding to involve Spain in military conflict in northern Italy, Olivares miscalculated very badly. The war of the Manchuan succession in 1628 to 31 undermined, perhaps fatally, the Count Duke's hopes of securing a general European peace on the terms that he would have liked. Spain emerged from that Mantuan conflict with its resources diminished, its rep reputation badly damaged. But there would still be moments between 1631 and 5 when the Count Duke believed that the monarchy was on the point of achieving a triumphant resolution of its problems. And yet, overshadowing everything was a looming prospect of war with France, which the Count Duke regarded as the sole pillar of the upheavals of all Europe. He was desperate to defer the outbreak of open war with France for as long as possible, because, as he said, the danger of breaking with France is great and war is by its nature uncertain. 
And when war finally came in 1635, it was, as he'd hoped, the King of France and not of Spain who declared it. And that lent credibility to the Count Duke's efforts, the, uh, his propaganda machine, to prove to the world that France was the aggressor and that Spain was fighting a just and defensive war whose sole aim was the restoration of peace to Christendom. And that Franco-Spanish war from 1635 placed enormous additional strains on the fiscal, military, and administrative resources of a Castile and a Spanish monarchy that had been heavily stretched by the unending conflict with the Dutch and then by Spain's interventions in northern Italy and central Europe on behalf of the emperor. Mobilization for this new war threatened to destroy the last vestiges of a reform program that had long been faltering. And yet at the same time, the absence of long postponed reforms made it all more, hard, all more harder to mobilize effectively for war. War and reform proved to be incompatible and the failure to achieve reform weakened Spain's prospects of winning the war. And Richelieu was faced with the same dilemma and reacted in a similar manner. Both knew that their countries were in desperate need of peace. Both continually put out peace feelers as the conflict escalated, and both drove their peoples to the brink as they struggled to raise more men and money for the war. In a paper written late in 1636 about a proposal for the invasion of France in the region of Bayonne, the Count Duke wrote that his only wish was for the tranquility of peace, keeping nothing that belongs to anybody else, but only what God gave your majesty, a peace so free of anxiety that your majesty can enrich your great realms and vassals and let them flourish in justice, piety, and ease. It was a noble ideal, but over and over again it was thwarted by the fluctuating fortunes of war. Papal attempts at arbitration were brushed aside by both parties, and attempts at direct negotiation between Paris and Madrid floundered because neither was willing to lose short-term advantages for the sake of a long-term and nebulous settlement. Meanwhile, as one can see from the Count Duke's correspondence with the governor of Flanders, the Cardinal Infante, his expressions of the need for peace became increasingly desperate and urgent. God give us, he wrote in 1639, one day of peace so that I can go and die. The disasters that overtook Spain in 1639 to 40, the loss of the Spanish fleet at the Battle of the Downs, the revolt of Catalonia, the fall of the besieged city of Arras to the French, in August 1640, appeared to have swung the conflict decisively in favor of France. And now it was defeat, not victory, that had to be explained. The Count Duke had his answer, and again it was cast in theological terms. Commenting on the fall of Arras, he told the council, what can be done here and now, and it is right that it should be done, is to give continuous thanks to God for punishing us so that the divine will is done, and ask him to direct things to his service and to assist us with his protection and favor, for his cause is ours. His cause is ours. This was a conviction that had traditionally shaped Spanish policy in times of war and peace alike. Olivares, like his predecessors in the government of Spain, never had any doubt about the rightness of Spain's cause while recognizing that ultimately the disposition of all things lay in God's hand. But as a statesman born in the age of Botero and Justus Lipsius, he was keenly aware of the need to employ the many weapons in the, army of Prudentia, in the armory of Prudentia to achieve by ingenuity and effort all that it was possible to achieve by human means. Since it had become apparent in the wake of the recent disasters, that Spain could no longer sustain two wars at once, he now believed, as he told the council, that this is a good moment to arrange a reasonable truce with the Dutch without the participation of France. Well, even that would take time, that truce with the Dutch, and would eventually be achieved at the Peace of Münster of 1648, five years after Olivares fell from power. The heretical Dutch Republic, however, was one matter, and France another. For another 11 years after Münster, the cars of war and peace, led respectively by Saturn and Jupiter, would go lumbering on side by side until they came to a halt at the Pyrenees in 1659, with Jupiter exhausted 
but finally triumphant. Thank you.